Hello. How you doing? Oh, good, good. <laughs> so I'm Bryony Cole. I'm the host of Future of Sex, the podcast that explores the evolving worlds of sex and tech. And yeah, we're here at WNYC. This is the first panel for the summer. We do a summer series. And um, we'll be covering consent tonight, the future of consent. And so before we dive into it with our amazing panellists, there's a couple of housekeeping items. Um, we're going to be live streaming, if you didn't know that already. So you may appear on video if you're part of the audience Q&A, um, which will be the last half of the show. So... If you have any questions, save them till then. And if you have any questions you want to ask in the meantime, FOS consent, future of sex consent, is the hashtag we'll be using on Twitter. And our objective with the time that we have here today is to share some thinking about consent. As we can see, the significance of the Me Too movement means we're finally paying attention, real attention, to an age-old issue. And people are learning better ways to talk about consent. And in my research I've been doing around sex and technology and looking at how the two intersect, I've seen a number of ways consent is being impacted by tech. From the damaging effects of revenge porn to newer anti-rape innovations like the Rape Axe in South Africa, which is essentially a tampon that's inserted to prevent rape, um, to here in the US on-campus assault reporting platforms like Callisto. So I really uh, want us to explore how technology um, may change the attitudes we have around sex and consent and whether it can even be used for consent. And um, could there be a place in the future for tech to enable consent and help it rather than hinder? And this is why I've brought together an all-star panel today. It, I'm so delighted to have all of these amazing people under the one roof. So I'd like to welcome Cindy Gallup, Clover Hope, and Emma Solkovitz. Sulko yeah, you did it. Yeah, I did it. <laughs> um, they've all been chosen very specifically because they are leaders in their field, they're outspoken on this topic, and they're creating new dialogues around consent. So. The way this is going to work, if you haven't been to a panel before, instead of reading awkward bios about each of the panellists, I'm going to ask them a question about their work as a means of introduction, which means that sometimes they'll be talking for a few minutes and we'll just be sitting here and listening to them as well. First of all, over here, right over the other side, is Cindy Gallup. She's the founder of Make Love Not Porn, pro-porn, pro-real sex, pro-knowing the difference, Cindy started Make Love Not Porn at a TED uh, talk in 2008 where she was the first person to ever say, come on my face, about four times on the TED stage, I think. Six times, actually. Six times. <laughs> and did anyone ever say it since? I don't know. But um, it is such a pleasure to be in your orbit. And um, as a tech entrepreneur and has working in this field for quite some time, I wanted to ask you about the opportunities and threats technology poses in terms of consent. Specifically, what does Silicon Valley need to do to foster consent and sex positivity in their products or services? Just before I answer that question, guys, um, while we clearly coordinated our outfits to appear in black and white on the stage, <laughs> be aware that actually our conversation will contain many shades of grey. <laughs> Very appropriately. Um, so... Um, there are two very simple things that Silicon Valley can and should do to foster consent and sexual openness. They're both very simple. That doesn't mean they're easy. But if Silicon Valley really wanted to do both of these things, it absolutely could. The first is to ensure that every single tech platform and tech product is founded and designed and operated by a completely gender equal and diverse and inclusive team. Because white men are not the people in our society who generally are harassed and abused, both online and offline. And that means that the giant and highly influential tech platforms of our day were designed by people who saw no reason to design for what is now happening rampantly on all of them. Um, and 
All you have to do is ensure that the people who are tasked with designing and, and leading these platforms are the people who understand what it's like to deal with issues of consent and therefore to make sure that consent is fundamental to everything you do. So uh, I mean, I'll give you one example. Um, and, and, and by the way, um, just in terms of the work I do, one of the things I am doing is raising the world's first and only sex tech fund because I want to bring applications of sex tech to areas of exponential growth in tech where sex has historically been banned or excluded. So, for example, messaging. Apps like Snapchat and WhatsApp refuse to admit that their enormous growth their gigantic valuations, their humongous IPOs are driven by one thing and one thing only, sexting. Here's the... Pro and, 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 literally, and literally, by the way, guys, if they are asked about immediate interviews, they will evade the question. You know, the, um, here's the problem. When, A, you refuse to admit that sexting is a perfectly normal, universal human activity, and, B, you refuse to admit that a shit ton of it goes on in your platform, you then do not design for it. You do not design within Snapchat, within WhatsApp, for consent, for security, for intimacy, for confidentiality. And that is why we have the colossal revenge porn problem that we currently have. Mm -hmm. Make Love Not Porn TV is a female-founded venture with a team that is more female than male and a team that is diverse. We spent literally years concepting and designing our social sex platform before we ever built it, because we knew that if we wanted to invite people to do something they've never done before, socially share their real world sex, we had to think through every possible ramification of that mm. to create a completely safe and trustworthy space. So, so that, that's point one. You know, have the diverse team that will ensure that you design consent and you design empathy and sensitivity into absolutely everything about the way your platform operates. And then number two is understand that the answer to everything that worries people about sex, about porn, is not to shut down, but to open up. So I mean that um, generally in terms of opening up the dialogue around all of this in the way that Brian is doing with her fantastic podcast. Open up to welcoming, supporting, and funding entrepreneurs like me who want to help disrupt all of this for the better. And open up to allowing all of us to do business in the same way that everybody else does. Because I can tell you, as a sex tech founder, we fight a battle every day. But um, the reason why opening up is important is because that's when you address the issue of consent at its most fundamental level. And, and it's what we're doing at Make Love Not Porn. Our entire mission is one thing only, to make it easier for everyone in the world to talk about sex. Mm. Now, when I say that, because we don't talk about sex, People don't understand how massively, profoundly, fundamentally beneficial that would be. Here's what I mean. I designed Make Love Not Porn around my own beliefs and philosophies, one of which is that everything in life starts with you and your values. So I regularly ask people this question. What are your sexual values? And nobody can ever answer me because we're not taught to think that way. Many of us, if we're lucky, are born into families where our parents bring us up to have good manners, a work ethic, sense of responsibility, accountability. Nobody ever brings us up to behave well in bed. But they should, because they're empathy, sensitivity, generosity, kindness, honesty, as important as they are in every other area of our lives where we are actively taught to exercise those values. So when we all open up, when we all talk about sex, when we can do that on these platforms, parents will bring their children up openly to have good sexual values and good sexual behavior in the same way they currently bring them up openly to have good values and good behavior in every other area of life. We will therefore cease to bring up rapists because the only way you end rape culture is by instigating in society an openly, universally talked about, discussed, promoted, operated, and very importantly, aspired to gold standard of what are good sexual values and good sexual behavior. When you do that, you also end Me Too, sexual harassment, sexual abuse, sexual violence, 
all areas where the perpetrators rely on the fact that we do not talk about sex to ensure their victims will never speak up, never go to authorities, never tell anybody. When you end that, you mass empower women and girls worldwide and create, you create a far happier world for all of us, including men. And so the second thing that Silicon Valley needs to do is open up to allowing all of this to be discussed, be shared socially, um, be brought out of the shadows and into the light in order to encourage good sexual values and good sexual behavior. I think that's a brilliant answer. Um, and what's most interesting, I think, is this idea of sex, which we think real sex. When you're talking about sex, it's not just about the act or this creepy thing or the physical thing. When you're talking about empathy and communication and whatever, listening and all those things around sex, that's the important stuff that should go into the products and should open up the conversation and normalise this conversation about sex. I always love the sexual values question too. I've, I've heard that and always thought about it. It's great. Thanks, Cindy. And, uh, and actually, sorry, if I, if I can just um, add one more thing to that. I mean, you're absolutely right, Brian. You know, we default to sex to an act, a thing we do. It's not yeah. its personality. And if we all just accepted we're all sexual beings, we could all interact more openly and honestly mm -hmm. around that. And we could do that online and through technology as well. Yeah. And I'd love to see that. That's the, that's the real stuff, right, when it comes to sex. It's not just the anatomy lesson. It, that is the real stuff. Mm -hmm. And what you're showing with Make Love Not Porn, and that's the important stuff that we push away. Um, great answer. All right. Emma, you are an artist and an activist. You're well known for your mattress performance. Hi, guys. Hi. How are you going? Sorry. Hi. No, great to see you. Thanks for coming. Um, sorry, Emma Solkowitz is an artist and an activist well known for her mattress performance art piece in 2014 and 2015 where you carried around a 50 pound mattress on Columbia University campus to symbolise the weight of the burden associated with being sexually assaulted by a fellow student and the lack of appropriate response from university officials. You recently said in a Jezebel article this year... <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> I had forgotten that I'd said this. <laughs> I always wonder what would have been different about my sexual assault hearing back at Columbia if it had happened this year instead of back then. And so my question is, what shifts are you seeing in the way we're thinking, uh, talking, reporting on consent now in 2018 compared to back then in 2014? Yeah, totally. Thank you for that introduction. I also want to say that um, I, I should have told you this in the green room. My, my pronoun is they, so. Oh, thank you. It's, it's okay. We're me. all good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, I think the, the only way I can really answer this question is by figuring out how to speak into a microphone that's so low. <laughs> <laughs> I can and, push it up. Um, and uh, uh, kind of just telling my whole story. And I, I feel like lately when I've been um, doing kind of speaking engagements, it's, I felt that it's important to go through that whole story. Something I used to be averse to uh, in the past, but um, I've been very upset with the way that everything has kind of like sedimented into the history of Wikipedia, like of trashy Wikipedia articles. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's important to actually give a clear picture of what happened. Um, so uh, yeah, I was, I was assaulted on the first day of my sophomore year at Columbia um, I, by a friend um, who I'd slept with before. And I, I always, n lately I've been thinking about how um, my father's, parents are both Jewish con Holocaust concentration camp survivors. Um, they're, my grandfather was in Auschwitz and my grandmother, we think, was in Ravensbrück. And my um, mom is half Japanese, half Chinese. So I, I think a lot about how um, perhaps the way I reacted to trauma is not the way that everyone would react to trauma since um, they found that uh, Holocaust trauma is passed down genetically and you know all that stuff so I bring this up to say that I did not call the police when I was assaulted um I think many survivors are expected to do so but for me I you know was very used to being a straight-a student and kind of repressing everything in lieu of being a perfectionist and um you know I told a few friends but asked that they not tell anyone um I, and I was successful at repressing it mostly um, until I met this woman at a party uh, and she kind of locked eyes with me and 
we had this silent communication of like, okay, we need to talk. So we made a coffee date and we were having coffee on the steps of Lowe Library in the middle of Columbia University. And she said that she'd been in a violent relationship with the same guy who assaulted me. She'd heard through the Whisper Network that about what had happened to me. And um, in this coffee date, we discussed other, rela um, other rumors we'd heard um, and I ended up reaching out to a number of women that I'd, we'd heard rumors about, and the number totaled six. So mm. he was a serial predator. And it really just felt like I was in this crazy science fiction movie. I was like, you know, the num like we kept meeting person after person and learning about person after person. It was like terrifying. And we were like, okay, so clearly this isn't just about like me repressing my emotions so I can get good grades anymore. This is actually a problem. And if we don't do something about this, uh, we're actually endangering our classmates. So me and two of the survivors uh, reported our assaults to the school. We did that because we have these, you know, you get to college and you're given this handbook and it's like, are you, you know, if you're raped, call the rape crisis center. So we did that, right? Um, our cases were dragged out for like a year. We, um, they were all thrown away for different reasons. And we were like, oh my God, we just wasted so much time. Um, and I won't even get into the nitty gritty of like how much of a circus our hearings were. Um, so uh, we went, well, how much do I want to tell? So. I ended up being a public survivor because um, Senator Gillibrand was working on this campus sexual assault bill, and she read about what had happened to me and the other two survivors in the Columbia Magazine. Someone had written a, an anonymous article about us. Her team contacted the writer of the article saying, would one of the survivors you wrote about feel comfortable being public? Um, and we kind of, it was this weird, like, almost drawing straws thing. Um, one, I ended up being the one to go public. One woman felt like her story wasn't crazy enough because um, she'd managed to throw him off before he actually went any further with her. And the other woman just didn't feel confident enough. And I was like, all right, I'll throw myself on the sword. So that's when I became a public survivor. And um, our stories were featured on the front page of the New York Times. And I started getting a lot of, you know, con contact from people, strangers, um, saying all sorts of things, but a big thing was, why haven't you gone to the police? Why haven't you gone to the police? So in New York, you're, you have up to five years to report your assault to the police, um, and we were well within our limit. So we reported it all to the police, and they were similarly terrible, um, like, you know, to the level where the detective kept insisting that my attacker had gotten creative with me, um, and I was like, no, he raped me, and he's like, so he got creative with you. And I was like, we clearly have different <laughs> definitions of creativity. Um, so, so it was just like, and then they would call me at random times throughout the day and transfer the case. And I'd have to tell the whole story again to another person who was an idiot. It was just ridiculous. I had to cancel the case because mm -hmm. um, it was driving me insane. And the DA said it would take at least a year to get to court. And I was like, wow, that sounds great, a year of this. And then by then we'll have already graduated. So nothing would have happened. So I just was like, I have more important things to do. Mm -hmm. So I came up with Mattress Performance, which is <laughs> this uh, artwork I did for my senior year at Columbia where I carried a mattress that was the same type of mattress that I was assaulted on everywhere I went on Columbia's campus um, for as long as I went to school with my attacker, or our attacker. And I tell this story because I think one thing that gets really lost in the Wikipedia article was that it was our attacker and not just my mm -hmm. attacker. Um, and the other th the other reason I tell this story is that um, people often think that I was carrying my mattress because it was a way of getting him kicked off. Uh, sorry off of Columbia's campus, but actually we'd tried doing that and realized that there was no way he would get kicked out. So actually, like I knew I was gonna be graduating with this mattress. I was really interested in the idea that I'd be carrying it for nine months. Um, it's the same length as a pregnancy. I was, you know, for many artistic reasons, I was really interested in that. Um, so I like telling that story just to like clear up some of the myth that's um, come up about that piece. Um, 
and it's so crazy because I feel like that piece, I mean, by the end of the first day of that piece, there were already reporters following me back to my dorm. Um, it blew up instantaneously. And um, at one point, there was an international day of action where 150 schools worldwide carried mattresses on um, in like anti-rape rallies on their campuses. And um, I think that nowadays, if a person is going to become a media sensation, they like come prepared with like a PR team and a manager and like at least an assistant to deal with all of their emails. But like, <laughs> I feel like I was completely taken off guard because mm. I never, I mean, you know, a, a lot of people have, sorry, I won't even go down that thought trail, but like, I just never thought that this would ever happen. Um, and I, it, it feels so crazy because back then when the three of us came forward with our assaults, we were spoken about as if we had been colluding. You know, there was this, our school, the administration said we weren't even allowed to talk to each other. They tried to put like, you know, they tried to enforce that. I didn't even know how they would enforce that, but they told us we weren't allowed to talk to each other for the duration of the hearings, even though we'd become friends, right? Um, whereas today, I mean, we have this Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. um, celebrities are coming out with their, their stories. Um, and on the whole, I feel like when a bunch of survivors all come out in unison, they're pretty much believed. They're not mm -hmm. colluding anymore. Um, and so there's this part of me that feels like uh, yeah, somehow I had, I and the other survivors at Columbia had to like uh, get thrown under the bus so that this this uh, movement could happen. We mm -hmm. were like one of the first casualties, um, and so yeah. When I when you bring up that quote, definitely like I I wonder if someone else had thrown themselves under the bus. Yeah. Um, and I I came out with this movement today. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure we would be believed, but um, back then um, there just wasn't some sort of, there wasn't a groundwork for that kind of belief or that kind of, mm -hmm. um, you know, understanding about the way sexual assault works. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's an intro. <laughs> well, that is an intro. And thank you also for sharing all the, the backstory that you don't find online and we need to update Wikipedia. I mean, it's crazy yeah. because um, this, I feel like I'm only gesticulating with my right hand because this is, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's been this one Wikipedia, female Wikipedia editor um, and she's been so dedicated about correcting my Wikipedia page, mm -hmm. which also it's like not really my Wikipedia page because my, my personal mm -hmm. Wikipedia page is combined with mattress performance. So mm -hmm. like most artists have like a person and then artworks, but right. like people refuse to acknowledge that I'm separate from my artwork. Um, so mm -hmm. she's been working so hard to correct that. But then as soon as she does anything, like 10 men will come in and like re reverse her changes. Um, I mean, there was some crazy statistic, right? Like 95% of Wikipedia editors are male. Mm -hmm. I'm botching that. Go look up the actual number, but it's something <laughs> it is that sounds about right. It's something Very that good. bad. Yeah, yeah. Well, you also endured, and we don't have to talk about this if you don't want to. But I know from your artwork that you also endured a lot of behind the scenes. Uh, is there any other way to put it? But hate and comments and trolls online, yeah. as well as part of that. Yeah. Um, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and I wonder today, I'm sure that that would be the same, but perhaps there would also be communities of support online that were a lot more easy to access that perhaps weren't only a couple of years ago. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, I think back then, because I was one of the first people to ever um, go public about this and stand up for something like mm. this, there were fewer targets, right? Like the MRAs were like, okay, well, we really only have a selection of five, right? <laughs> but now so many people are going public, it's like they don't have time for everyone. You know right, right. <laughs> so, um, so definitely, I mean, one story I've been thinking about a lot was um, how when on, in the days leading up to my graduation, um, this 
Chuck C. Johnson, I believe his name is, this um, men's rights activist leader. Men's rights activists are activists who hate feminism and hate women generally and don't believe in rape, you know, very savory people. <laughs> um, but he, he was writing things like, I have a big surprise for Mattress Girl. I have big plans for graduation. And I thought he was going to murder me. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just didn't have anyone to look up to for, this, for support in this moment because there just wasn't anyone who'd ever gone through something like what I was going through. Um, and I just remember being like, oh my God, if only I could ask for advice from someone. And I remember thinking it was so important to me, this is crazy, you guys. It was so important to me to finish Mattress Performance that I was okay with being shot. So I, mm -hmm. I decided that, you know, it was more important for me to walk across the stage with the mattress than, and, you know, potentially die there than, you know, give it up. Um, and I was, I remember being so relieved on the day of graduation to see these posters go up all over the entire neighborhood surrounding Columbia University that had the image of me from the cover of New York Magazine where I'm like holding the mattress um, with the words pretty little liar across my body and then hashtag Emma Salkowitz, which is spelled wrong, and hashtag rape hoax. And, um, um, yeah, I was like, oh, thank God that was the big surprise. <laughs> but, like, how crazy of a yeah. oh my God. position is that? Oh my God. Like, when you're relieved that a crazy Jesus men's rights Christ. activist covered the neighborhood in, like, posters calling you a liar. Because like, at least he didn't kill you. Yeah. yeah. God almighty. <laughs> God almighty. What a terrifying yeah. place to even be in, to yeah. even have to have those thoughts and kick into, like, just trauma mode. Yeah, and there was just no one who I could be like, hey, so mm. when this happened to you, <laughs> what did you do? Because <laughs> yeah. it did not happen to anyone. Um, so anyway, yeah. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> oh, God. It was so crazy. Oh, Chuck yeah. is infamous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Chuck, uh, yeah. He's... You know about, yeah. right? Well, you would yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so excited for her introduction. <laughs> <laughs> so Clover Hope <laughs> knows all about Chuck and... <laughs> is also the culture editor for Jezebel and has written in a variety of amazing, impressive publications like New York Times and Wired. Um, and you write extensively on pop culture issues surrounding identity. And it's kind of a perfect segue is to think about as the general public learns um, more about better ways to talk about consent. And as people gain the vocab to do so, how can the media responsibly cover the nature of consent alongside that? Yeah, um, I think they touched on um, like a few good points. Like one really important thing we have to do is basically equip people with the right appropriate or like kind of, um, you know, just like collective vocabulary to even just have the conversation, even like the word conversation, like is like you're, you hear that a lot more um, around like Me Too, like the Me Too movement and conversation. Um, you know, like two years ago, Me Too wasn't uh, in the lexicon at all. So now we have a way to, you know, talk about this uh, topic that people kind of have relegated to personal conversations and um, we're bringing it public. And one way to kind of, like we need to basically like establish a uh, vocabulary and equip like readers and just people <laughs> mm. with the, you know, ways to talk about it. Um, Especially because, you know, right now it's so much of it, like, you know, like your story is like heavy. It's like a, a, it's a heavy topic and it's one of the heaviest like anyone will deal with in their life or like, you know, know someone who has dealt with. Um, and so, you know, just kind of agreeing on words is even, you know, something that we talk about a lot at Jezebel words not to use or like ways to describe, um, you know, like survivor versus victim, um, accused allegations, like those words are really important when you are reading something and like making up, you know, um, not making up your mind, but like uh, make up your mind on like how to discuss it amongst your friends or, your, you know, like whoever. Um, and so I think just people kind of um, trying to, <laughs> You know, just having these um, conversations where we c come up with, uh, establish a vocabulary. Um, 
if you think about like coercion, um, misconduct wasn't really kind of like in the public lexicon before. Um, sexual misconduct, um, sexual abuse, sexual assault, you know, like the different, the legal differences between these things um, and rape and kind of people and like the, you'd be surprised how many people kind of like don't know the distinctions. And so I think it is, um, you know, like part of the media job to make those, make sure it's clear and not be, uh, you know, like sloppy with it. Um, Cause it's important to kind of, um, obviously it's important to, you know, get those things right. Um, so one is just kind of, um, you know, like whether we're using Me Too when it's, when it's uh, appropriate for like a story, um, that in itself, um, you know, creates this, I mean, it's a hashtag now. Um, that in itself kind of like, helps people to have a communicate better about sex to talk about sex um when you can kind of like reference the same words i hope mm -hmm. that's not like babbling um and the other thing is just like facilitating conversation um the general conversation um through these words um and it's you know reporting on the stories that uh haven't been um really publicized before although you know like women's media has been talking about these topics for a long time and now it's kind of like the mainstream more opening it mm -hmm. up and kind of like learn learning you know um sometimes it winds up they you know like wind up misusing um you know like certain phrases or talking about it um in a way that's like disruptive um or like you know counterproductive to the to like uh progress so, um, are there some examples of that? Um, of mainstream, yeah, so, or like things, yeah, where you're like, oh, that, you mentioned sloppy before, or like it just, yeah, kind of I mean, I'm sure some. everyone knows like uh, the babe.net um article that came out about um Aziz Ansari, and we wrote a piece at Jezebel just kind of about the handling of um the account and how it you know it should have been um just better vetted, better, more responsibly uh, written, more responsibly reported. Um, because when we're talking about these sensitive topics, anything that you write or report, like it just opens up a, a wormhole for, you know, if you get one thing wrong, then mm -hmm. someone who's like opposed to, I don't know how, like opposed to like Me Too or, some, it just opens up like the door for trolls or people um, who are counterproductive to uh, making things better, um, to have like an argument. Um, so, you know, like that article was kind of, um, you know, there are uh, good things and, you know, bad things about, um, it, it's, it's good to kind of like have those types of stories out there but then also um, like it needs to be responsibly executed basically. So um, because there are all these lines and like people want to say like, oh, just he didn't, like just because it wasn't rape, like it doesn't count or, you know, and we have to kind of, um, you know, it's, it's messy, it's complicated and we have to kind of like work that out together responsibly, <laughs> I feel like. You know, and, um, you know, like part of that is the media's responsibility. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, you can't sort of give crumbs to the lions, vulture, I don't know, <laughs> to, to yeah. feed on, in the in especially on the internet. Um, how, how about like with the Me Too movement now? Like it, it's so powerful that it is just it's this hashtag. Like what are, are there like codes or anything in the media around how you report on that now, given the momentum it's had? Um well, I, I think like the Times uh, reporting on Weinstein and the New Yorkers really broke things open as far as how people talk about, um, well, talk about sex and talk about abuse and assault. And because as I mentioned, like, you know, misconduct wasn't, you know, people kind of, well, are kind of like still trying to define it, like, but it wasn't even, people weren't really in the public kind of talking about like what misconduct is or what qualifies as you know these different types of abuse toward women um 
so I think that kind of opened it up to kind of, um, at least, you know, in a wider sphere, mm-hmm. opened it up for um, their readers and like readers in general, the public to be able to, um, you know, have the conversation um, in a way that they feel like they'll be understood. Uh, and also you'll notice, um, you know, like now it's, it, it became kind of this thing where um, amount or like the like number of sort accounts um, was important like to be believed because if it was just like one person against Weinstein it would not have had the same impact as all these famous women and so now it's like um, you'll see like three women have accused so and so of whatever because you know amount is like uh, part of the um, I don't know, some, somehow, you know, like that's become part of like the story. Mm-hmm. That's one. And then, um, what was the other thing? So the amount and then like um, the way, you know, like confirmation, corroborations basically. So you'll see in all these stories, um, like so and so's friend uh, confirmed that they told that the, you know, like the person had told them about this account like at the time or five years ago. And so, you know, you'll see these things repeated because now it's part of kind of like, um, it's part of the uh, reporting and part of the narrative of Me Too. It's like, all right, you have like so and so amount of um, accusers, you have like people who are close to them corroborating it. And a lot of that was, you know, the the time, the Weinstein allegations basically like opened that up to mm-hmm. um, become, I guess, like a template of sorts. Mm-hmm. Totally. Um, I'm going to open it up to the group now and continue on the Me Too um, discussion and thinking about how sex tech can be used to continue the momentum of the Me Too movement or advance it. I'm going to start over, back over there. <laughs> well, for good um, reason. For, well, <laughs> for the benefit of the audience, we should define sex tech. Um, and as I wrote the definition of it, if you Google sex tech, I'm result one on page one. So I'll, I, will, I will do that for you. Um, w- w- when we use the term sex tech, what we mean is any form of technology or tech venture designed to innovate, disrupt, and enhance in any area of human sexuality and human sexual experience. And one of the things that enormously frustrates me is that because we are so narrow-minded as a society about sex, when you say the word sex tech, uh, sex tech, people's minds instantly think it can be one of only two things, sex toys, sex robots. I get <laughs> interviewed about sex robots every... I mean, I'm, I'm constantly asked to comment on sex robots every week. It gets really boring. I can promise you that we have not even begun to see what sex tech is and can be. Rule 34 of the Internet states, if it exists, there is porn of it. Gallup's, Gallup's rule of sex tech states, if the tech exists it can be sex tech. And so, you know, um, entrepreneurs, instead of going, well, I'm coming up with the Uber of blah, should be going, well, I'm coming up with the blank of sex. And, um, you know, uh, I think, you know, when you ask the question, Bryony, of, you know, how can sex tech um, advance the cause of Me Too? Well, first of all, um, I think, going back to my original point, in terms of opening all of this up, So the most interesting things things in sex tech today are coming from female founders. As I like to say, women challenge the status quo because we are never it. We are finally owning our sexuality, finding unique ways to leverage it in business terms because we get the enormous market that is women's needs, wants, and desires, historically deemed too embarrassing, shameful, taboo to address in business. And by the way, tap that huge primary market you also tap a huge secondary market of extremely happy men. Um, and so, you know, as, um, as Bryony knows, um, there are many, many brilliant um, female sex tech founders out there. You can find them at womenofsextech.com. Go there and you'll see an amazing community. And, you know, we are all building things that are designed to open up, you know, everything around all of this and create a better, healthier world around sexuality. So I think in the first instance, um, you know, that's what what sex tech can do. But also, um, it's like many things about technology. It all comes down to the intent. You know, um, you know, um, my frustration with being asked about sex robots is, um, and by the way, like many things, it also comes down to gender. Um, not only the tech world, but the tech media is dominated by men. And men find it a lot more comfortable when writing about sex tech 
to geek out on the side that is very easy to talk about, which is the hardware. Which is why all the coverage you'll see is, you know, teledildonics, VR porn, sex robots. <laughs> it's a lot more uncomfortable to talk about the side that I operate on, which is the software, which is using technology to help people have sex better in the real world. You know, which side do you think is more important for the future of humanity? The side that is about driving us all further and further apart into our own little virtual worlds, or the side that is about bringing us closer together? And so, you know, um, technology is a function of the place you're coming from when you design it and build it and decide how you want to use it. And in that sense, I actually think technology enables all of us to do many very powerful things that will combat Me Too, but it's not about the technology itself. Mm -hmm. It's about who's coming up with it and who is designing it and how it's intended to be used. Mm -hmm. I think some, sometimes, especially the tech geeks, get so carried away and get so excited that the tech is just going to be the solution and this will, well, well, we'll cover that in a second, but this will solve everything, you know, instead of thinking about it from the human side. Yeah, more realistic, like you said. The more realist mm. way is like, you know, yeah, like the soft, the software end of it. Absolutely. Anything? Jim? Yeah, um, well, you both brought up really exciting things that I wanted to respond to. Um, I, I was excited to hear you talking about the um, new ways in which language can be um, universalized on the internet, um, which I think is in a part way answer mm -hmm. of your question. Um, uh, I mean, I, I've read this theorist named Stuart Hall who talks about how political, sorry, this chair is so creaky. So it's not me <laughs> farting. Um, <laughs> it's uh, the chair. So Stuart Hall, um, Stuart Hall talks about how political change um, happens on the level of language. Um, and his example is the difference between black being bad versus the way, you know, we've We've all heard this phrase now, black is beautiful. So, so he's talking about that being a, that shift in language being a crucial moment for the black rights movement. Um, so, so now when we have things like hashtag me too, or even Harvey Weinstein, I'm so excited because I'm realizing that that might even be taking it another step from Stuart Hall's theory, which is that like we literally have a, have new words in the English language to describe things that we've never. Mm -hmm. had before. Um, I mean, how different would my story have been had I had the word hashtag me too to yeah. kind of describe what I was going through and what the other survivors I was in contact with were going through. Um, Harvey Weinstein is now a term for a person in, usually a man, in a position of institutional power who uses his power to take advantage sexually of people below him in that institution. Um, or uh, industry. And um, we literally never had a word for that before. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's changing the way we talk about these things. Um, and these women um, would never, and survivors would have never been connected with each other or connected with each other's stories that, with other stories that mirrored their experience had the internet not been there to mm -hmm. connect them. Um, so, so yeah, I think that that's crucial. Um, and, and actually, yeah, I, 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 I want to pick up on that, that yeah. point um, with, with something that, that we're doing at Make Love Not Porn, the audience may find interesting, which also plays into um, the role that language plays um, in, in everything we're talking about. Um, because we don't talk about sex, we have no socially acceptable vocabulary with which to do so. The language of porn has rushed in to fill that gap. And that is not good um, for a number of reasons, not least of which is that, as you would expect in a male-dominated industry, the language of porn is predominantly male-generated. So the person who coined the term finger-blasting didn't have a vagina. Because if you hear the term finger-blasting and you have a vagina, you want to cross your legs. <laughs> the person who coined the term getting her ass railed never got his ass railed. Pounding, banging, slamming, wrecking, destroying... All terms generated by the people who do not possess the soft internal tissue to which those things are being done. So at Make Love Not Porn, we are building a new language for real world sex, for social sex. We tag our social sex videos completely different from the usual porn drop down menus. We use tags like juicy, succulent. Our term for oral is downtown. 
Our tag for anal is deliberately derived from the recipient's experience of anal. We tag our anal sex videos, ow, 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 hey now. <laughs> <laughs> and we do that because we want you to take this language and use it beyond our platform in the real world. Because this is language you can use to talk about sex in public without being embarrassed about what's coming out of your mouth, without having to worry about being overheard in the bar or the coffee shop. And it's also language you can use to talk about what you want to do in bed in a celebratory, positive, and gender-equal way. Language matters. And we, we learn the language we use um, in many ways that we don't even realize we are unconsciously internalizing. And, and by the way, um, I will just say that... Um, you know, although we're here to talk about sex tech and not porn, um, it's enormously ironic that um, a few days ago, Mary Meeker, who is a partner in one of the most powerful venture capital firms in Silicon Valley, um, Kleiner Perkins, she delivered, as she does every year, her annual, eagerly awaited by the whole of Silicon Valley, Internet Trends Report. Mary Meeker delivers every year 200 slides that cover every single possible trend on the Internet. And this year, like every other year, Mary and Mika, Mika omitted any mention of the single biggest use of the internet, porn, and any mention of the single biggest trend that that is driving, which is its impact on real world sex. And by the way, she also omitted any mention of the next trillion dollar category in tech, which is sex tech. So when we don't talk about these things, um, we use different language that is not the right language, and, and this is absolutely the issue that, that they're all discussing here along a spectrum, ranging from our failure to communicate around the sex we're having with the people we're actually having it with while we're actually having it, you know, through to the language you use to talk about what's happened to you in a way that will get it understood, um, that fortunately is now happening much more than it used to. But language really, really matters. Yeah, yeah. even if you think about, you know... Um obviously like movies, popular culture, um, and the way that movies of the, this is coming back around now, like I'm sure you saw like the um, Molly Ringwall um, wrote about um, in the Breakfast, Breakfast Club and kind of just the language that they like would use in, in, these, um, in these projects that kind of like highlighted, highlighted the way that men see women, the way that men kind of like conquer women. Um, if, if you think about the term, like she gave it up being like a thing of like, uh, like a celebratory thing back then, um, you know, it's really just important to kind of also get rid of certain terminology um, as Absolutely. we're kind of like introducing new ones. Absolutely. Uh, I also, could I mm. respond to a point you made earlier mm. um, about uh, kind of the automatic sexualization of anything that goes on the internet, even when it's not supposed to be, <laughs> um, which I think is one of the big biggest things that needs to be talked about. I mean, um, personally, um, just being a person on the internet who is like, I mean, perhaps it has something to do with race. I'm, you know, mixed race, Asian, femme. Um, perhaps it has something to do with my presented gender. I mean, um, everything that got put out on the internet about me got sexualized. And um, I mean, like, when my attacker then, you know, sued the school so that he could release this weirdly cropped and, you know, he like selected choice Facebook messages that we'd mm -hmm. sent between us to like prove that I was asking to be raped or something. Um, it it seemed to be an invitation for all these people to send me unwanted sexual advances um, to my Facebook messages, my emails, um, you know, comments on Instagram. So many people have assumed that because I'm a public person, you know, for something that I never wanted to be public for in the first place, mm -hmm. um, I, it's an open invitation for like uh, me to be sexualized. Um, so, so I think that that's something, you know, th this assumption that everything is there to be turned into something sexual is so important, and you brought that up earlier, so yeah. Yep, no, and, and, and it's ironic that the answer to all of that is to normalize sexuality so it's just a fact of life. Mm -hmm. You know, um, t uh, th th there's this wonderful sex educator called Alvin Accio who um, also gave a TED talk, which is brilliant, um, and, and so Ted, um, some years ago, um, asked the two of us to be videoed kind of talking to each other about sex education. And one of the questions they asked us was, 
What is the one thing that you would like every parent to do um, when it comes to sex education and sex generally? And Al, Al had a brilliant answer, which is quite jarring when you hear it for the first time, which, which I think is superb. His answer was, I want every parent, when their child is born, the moment their baby is placed in their arms, to look at that child and think to yourself, this is a sexual being. And mm. he's absolutely right. We are all sexual beings. And when you accept that and normalize that from the get-go, then you don't sexualize things specifically because it's not allowed in, in the general course of life. And also, by the way, if you accept that everybody is a sexual being and understand that it's part of their motivations, you no longer look at priests and go, oh, he couldn't possibly abuse children. Mm. You don't look at gymnastics doctors and coaches and say, oh, no, no, they, they look so respectable, they couldn't possibly be doing all that nasty in the shadow stuff that we never talk about. When you just normalize sex, when you bring it out in the open, you go, we're all sexual beings, then not only is it possible to celebrate that and be enormously happy doing so, it also enables you to believe children when they talk to you about the fact that someone is touching inappropriately, and it enables you to understand that the people who look respectable are doing very bad things. <laughs> yeah. I think this is actually the perfect segue to throw to the audience questions now. Um, if anyone has a question. As you can tell, guys, you can ask us anything. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> In the back. Oh, yeah, there's a hand up over there. Hi. Um, this was great. Everyone um, has said some really insightful things. But um, I had a question sort of thinking back to um, something that was said about how one of the survivors at Columbia felt like they couldn't come forward because they felt as though their story wasn't bad enough. Um, and I think that's something that around consent and like especially with the Aziz Ansari story that came out too, that a lot of women and everyone has thought about, you know, what is the line that I can say something? And if I say something, are people going to not believe me or will it not be bad enough? And I, has that, I mean, I guess my question is from all of your perspectives, do you think that that has started to change with Me Too? Is that something that still, you know, today, if your trial was happening or the case was happening, would people, do you think she would have felt more confident to come forward? Can, can I jump in on that, be the first one? I feel like you answered your own question. Yeah. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. I mean, and that's so exciting. Um, when, when that survivor said that, it was heartbreaking, because, like, I didn't even feel like my case was bad enough, you know what I mean? Because one of the things that, you know, was repeated at me so many times to make me feel like it was somehow my fault was like, you know, I'd slept with the guy before, um, I'd consent, I'd brought him back to my room, right? There were so many ways in which my case wasn't bad enough. And it was like really fucked up that we had to like, sit, like we, you know, something bad had happened to all of us and more people and we had to choose, okay, which one is going to be the best for the media? Mm -hmm. And also like, my case still isn't that great for the media. Like, um, I mean, the fact that like, I'm more open about my sexuality than, you know, a pure virginal survivor who like, you know, <laughs> was wearing the chastity belt, um, like that, that has hindered, sorry, hindered people from believing me and like, um, yeah, I definitely uh, relate to and empathize with the survivor who um, finds that their case was like a gray area case um, and the only real truth that you can like hang on to is your own truth, right? Like I know that that was fucked up even though like, you know, maybe uh, science could prove that I'm a liar, right? Like um, <laughs> because, sorry. Um, yeah. You know, there's uh, one thing that I, I, I like to think about is how, you know, even when we want, you know, we have affirmative consent, right? Yes means yes. Like, we have to think about the, the you know, survivors who were in um, violent, intimate partner relationships um, who might have said yes because they were, you know, brainwashed or, like, in a really fucked up mm -hmm. violent relationship then later think back, oh my God, I really didn't mean yes, right? Like there's so much nuance we have to account for. So like it, one thing that's incredibly exciting about the Me Too movement is that we're bringing light to those cases that, you know, aren't perfect cases. Like 
people like me who aren't perfect survivors. Um, that, that, that in fact is one of the things that's been leveled at me a lot, right? Like if Emma were a real, real rape survivor, she would be crying more. If Emma were a real rape survivor, mm -hmm. she wouldn't make art about it, right? Like there's so many different things that you could list that make me mm -hmm. a not real rape survivor that one of my missions is to bring awareness to the idea that actually um, a real rape survivor is capable of an infinite number of things because um, real rape survivors are actually real Humans. people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, um, absolutely. We, we, ha um, we have to change the stories women tell ourselves in this situation. Um, eight months ago, in the wake of the Harvey Weinstein um, expose, um, I've been speaking out against sexual harassment publicly for years um, because nobody else would, and, and especially against sexual harassment in my industry, advertising. And so I put out a call to the advertising industry and I said, post Harvey Weinstein, the time has finally come to name names. Women and men of the ad industry write to me, name names, and, and let's get these stories broken. So for the past um, eight months, I have been seeing, um, I, I've had an avalanche of emails. Um, I always knew it was bad in my industry. I didn't know it was this bad. And one of the things that infuriates me is, uh, because my call out was very public, one of my male ad industry friends told me, a lot of men were saying to him, ooh, ooh, you know, um, you know, we might get on Cindy's list. And the implication was that there, there were going to be false accusations out the wazoo as a result. Mm. Honestly, you know, in eight months of hundreds of emails, not a, not a bloody false accusation among them. In fact, quite the opposite. Women who, uh, and by the way, you know, I feel a failure because I've not been able to um, get any of these people to speak publicly on the record because they're all terrified and understandably so. But, you know, women who will, who will say to me, you know, this man did this awful thing, but he has a wife. His wife's really lovely and he has children. I don't want to hurt them. That's why I don't want to go public. A woman wrote to me and, you know, she was subject to one of those consensual but not relationships that is the older, much more powerful boss. You know, as always, it's not about sex, it's about power. The, you know, the young junior employee um, had an affair. Um, she got pregnant. Um, you know, the baby was not wanted, obviously. She scheduled an abortion. And the night before the abortion, she was violently raped at an agency party by a drunk creative director. That is not even the worst part of this story. The worst part is that in her email, she told me this and she said, I've started and deleted this email 11 or 12 times because I've thought, surely Cindy has far more serious victims writing to her than me. I could not bloody believe it when I read that. We, you know, the good thing about everything that's coming out now is that it, 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 it brings a new lens for ourselves. It changes the stories. We, and by the way, you know, as a survivor, you will tell yourself the stories you need to survive. You will, mm -hmm. you know, but, but it's so important that we shine a light on the fact that, you know, as Emma just, I mean, all of this is utterly fucked up. There's nothing right about anything that happens to you. It is not your fault. It's nothing to do with you. And, and we need to expose all of this. Um, and, and it's really necessary. And it is happening slowly but surely. You know, I would like to see... Um, you know, these horrifying stories in my industry expose a damn sight more quickly. I'm, I'm working on that. But, um, but in the meantime, everything around us everywhere is just helping change all of this forever. Yeah, I think it's um, definitely like the, the ways that um, all the stories that are coming out are kind of helping people reevaluate like themselves, like their personal interactions, like... Mm -hmm. um, and kind of uh, bringing it back to like, these are the ways that kind of public um, discourse can, uh, you know, mm -hmm. change uh, personal, um, just personal interaction and like your uh, relationship dynamics, basically. Um, because if you before thought that the friend who like loves to have sex and if she told you a story about being assaulted, like, we wouldn't have believed her like three years ago, but now um, they're like, oh wait, like I'm not gonna put that judgment on her. Um, you know, like it's kind of like small things like that that are kind of like, it sucks that it would take like more of a um, public belief to change people's minds about that, but um, I guess that's just like one, that's like, you know, like an offshoot that's um, positive, that it's like, all right, perception um, and belief 
is changing. Like the idea of just like believing someone's story um, is ch like we're seeing that change mm. right now and have been seeing it. And I think, not to bring it back to technology, I seem to always do, but I think that's the power of the network, right? Or the, the, the digitized whisper network, I think is how you called it, um, which I loved. Um, and the shitty media men, Google Doc, and these things are slowly but surely helping people. And I'm curious, Cindy, if when you ask people, send me your stories, did you feel like that would be a way of them helping process it or you? where was the end point right. for you? Um, no, um, no, actually, it was very specific in my case, and I made this really clear. I, I was asking not for stories but for names. Mm -hmm. The stories have existed always. They're regularly published in trade industry journals, anonymous stories. When, when the media publish anonymous stories of Me Too and sexual harassment and assault and rape, women empathise and men don't give a shit. Mm. And so I wanted, I wanted to expose the names, um, which is what I was asking for specifically. And, you know, I think w what I would say about, um, you know, your reference to the digitization of that, Brian, a bit, because, um, you know, um, along with these shitty media men list, um, there is an initiative in my industry um, called Diet Madison Avenue, which is an anonymous Instagram account that has named names um, and has been very controversial accordingly. Um, when those things emerge, it's because the system is not working. Mm -hmm. when, when those things happen, it's because, you know, the companies and the people and the leaders that should be tackling this at source, they are not doing that. And so this has to come out in any way that, that it can. And, and yes, so people are using technology, whether it's, you know, the, um, the Google spreadsheet or whether it's the Diet Madison Avenue Instagram account. And, and you know... Um, I, we can't have too many people and too many initiatives tackling this from every possible angle. It's, um, it's a bit like, um, uh, you remember a couple of years ago when you know, Russia annexed Crimea and those women protested topless in front of the, I think it was the Ukraine parliament. I remember looking at them thinking, oh my God, I would never dream of protesting topless anywhere, but I'm so glad there are women who do that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, uh, and similarly, you know, I mean, we may not condone all the different approaches that are taken mm -hmm. to, to, to out this and confront it, but we cannot have too many of us trying in every possible way to change this once and for all. I mean, and okay. yeah, yeah, go, go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I have a word for that, that I've been like going around saying a lot, which is diversity of tactics. Um, and it's something Ooh. that I feel like is really important to think about right now because there are a lot of people who look at my work and are like, I would never do that. It's bad. And it's like, well, yeah, good. Don't do what I'm doing, <laughs> please. Yeah. Yeah. Like, if Ooh. everyone were doing what I was doing, we would Ooh. actually get nowhere. And the only way we're going to get somewhere <laughs> is if everyone does what yeah. they're best at yeah. mm -hmm. to fix the Absolutely. problem. And Absolutely. Like, like, you know, so Ooh. diversity of tactics is crucial. Um, and the thing that... What's crazy to, like, you know, diversity attack of tactics at play right here. I mean, you asked people for names, right? Um, and uh, I feel like I've kind of been, like, inadvertently doing the other half of that, which is just, like, I, you know, because I'm a public survivor, um, people just send me their stories. Um, and a lot of the time I'll get, like, a long essay length email that's like you don't even have to respond to this mm. I just need to say it and honestly I can't respond to them all because mm. I get so many um you know almost every day back back during master's performance I was getting even more and people would like come up to me on the street and like just start crying um and telling me their story and you know at first it was actually quite triggering because you know I was never trained as a counselor I was never trained to mm -hmm. deal with these um act you know for some people pressing emergencies even. Um, but now that I have a bit of distance, I think I've gotten better at it. I'm able to just, you know, if someone does approach me in person, I'm able to just be like, you know, I, I support you and like, I wish you the best. Th there's not much else I can do because like, I'm just one person. But um, yeah, I think that like, it, the Whisper Network is um, often dismissed as gossip by, um, men who, or, you know, even other women or whoever who would 
prefer that the Whisper Network didn't exist. Um, but gossip and the Whisper Network are actual survival strategies. Mm -hmm. um, not only do they help like lift the burden of carrying something all on your own, and you know, I see that happen in my inbox every day when people send their stories to me just so that they can feel like they've sent it somewhere and it's beyond them. Mm -hmm. um, but literal survival. I mean, like I remember um, when my case was being handled at Columbia, my, you know, one of my closest friends who was my supporter, you were allowed to have one person be your like designated supporter who could go through all the hearings with you and like sit there as you filled out paperwork and stuff. And she saw my attacker hitting on someone at somewhere. And she later went up to that woman and was like, I just want to like let you know that there are cases being processed about that guy. And she was like trying to protect her. Um, and someone overheard her doing that and reported it to the school and they punished her for gossiping about the case. Um, for everyone who's listening to this as a podcast later, I put air quotes on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and as her punishment, she had to write two essays, one from my perspective, this is my friend, one from wow. my perspective and one from my rapist oh, perspective, wow. e expressing how what she did violated both of our rights. Oh my God. And I was like, God. well, actually, no. I don't think you did. So my essay can be zero words long. And <laughs> um, oh my God, they expected her to write an essay from the perspective of my rapist? Like, Sick. ew. Sick. I hope no one ever has to do that for yeah. any rapist ever. Um, and like, one with an, a tone of indignance um, is even worse. So um, it, I, I just tell the story to show what great lengths institutions will go to to shut down the whisper network, which is really our only method of survival and keeping other you know, potential victims safe. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, go whisper network. And I'm really glad that the the internet exists to keep right. it alive and even make it stronger. Yeah. 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 Uh, I knew it. <laughs> lots now lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Hey, who have we got? There we go. Um, so I guess kind of thinking about the idea of diversity of tactics, um, it's really exciting, but also really disheartening that we're kind of only just now getting these, you know, like we were talking about how language is now um, evolving, I guess, to better fit like our needs and to be, um, to so we, and be there so we can talk more about these issues and about, you know, all this stuff. Um, so like, that's great that that's happening now, but I feel like we should also think about trying to get like in front of the in front of the curve, I guess, in the terms of maybe um, like VR porn, which you mentioned earlier, how it's kind of just like this flashy new thing, but it um, just like thinking about how how we use the language that we're that we're it feels like we're discovering now to kind of um, you know go keep evolving if that makes sense as we evolve with our like technology and um thinking about um virtual reality and all this stuff so i guess my question is just how do we um continue to translate the this language and how to um transform it so that it is as inclusive and as um i guess helpful feels really i don't know like a small word but yeah, how do we include it in everything that we are doing now? Um, but because you've referenced sex tech, um, um, let me respond to that. Um, unfortunately, um, the massive inhibitor to progress in that scenario is exactly the conversation we're having now. Um, um, I spoke briefly earlier about the fact that I and my team fight an enormous battle every single day to build Make Love Not Porn. That's because every single piece of business infrastructure any other tech startup can just take for granted we can't because the small print always says no adult content and that is all pervasive across every single area of the business in ways that people outside the sphere don't realize you know we can't get funded 
we can't get banked. It took me four years to find one bank here in America that would allow me to open a business bank account for Make Love Not Porn. Our biggest operational challenge is payment processing. PayPal won't work with adult content. Stripe that enables you to take credit cards on the internet can't. You know, mainstream credit card processors won't. Every single tech service that we need to use, and you know, on a monthly basis we use 12 or 14, um, the terms of service always say no adult content. You know, I have to go to the people at the top of the company, explain what we're doing, beg to be allowed to use their service. Sometimes they'll let me, sometimes they won't. It's very labor intensive. We had to build our entire video sharing, video streaming platform from scratch ourselves as proprietary technology because existing streaming services, off the shelf components, will not stream adult content. Even something as apparently as simple as finding an email partner, send a membership emails out with. MailChimp won't work with us. Six or seven rejected us till we found SendGrid who would. Um, anybody who is trying to do anything forward thinking with sex has the same problems. You know, uh, um, that, by the way, is the reason why we don't know enough about anything to do with sex, because for all the reasons I battle, nobody is building the comm score of sex and porn. My friends who are academics can't even get grants to fund any research to do with sex. Um, and by the way, distrust any research that exists out there, because there's so little of it. You know, it is absolutely subject to confirmation bias. And it's also research in the area where there's the widest gap between what people say and what people actually do. And so, um, you know, we are, um, we are trying, but it's very, very difficult. I regularly get asked um, um, by journalists, Cindy, you know, you know, why are we so repressed about sex? You know, why do you think... You know, I've been asked this so often that I have my answer down pat. Three reasons. Number one, centuries of repression, religion, social cultural dynamics in every country in the world. This is a global issue. Number two, the patriarchy. Because historically, every single institution, including the government and religion, has been male-dominated. We've never been allowed as women to bring our lens to bear on human sexuality and the world as a poorer place for it. And reason number three is there are not enough people like me. And what I mean by that is, as I've just said, the world makes it extraordinarily difficult to disrupt social narratives around sex. Many people try and give up because they just absolutely cannot fight the battle any longer. You need people like me who will not give up no matter what. The thing that most motivates me is a dynamic of call, I'm going to fucking well show you. You tell me it can't be done, I'm going to fucking well show you. Put on some path, I'm going to fucking well show you. We, and by the way, guys, if, you know, those of you in the audience, I exhort you to do this as well, because it's only when we all do this that we break down those barriers. Um, so sorry, very long-winded answer to say, unfortunately, it's not as easy as that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah just because, like, it, I guess. Um, I just think it's so interesting to hear about how, like when you were talking about Emma, about how, um, you think it would be so different, you know, like if it was the um, last year versus now. And I just like want to try to figure out how do we keep going, you know, like how do we prevent people this year from experiencing something that they would that would be easier in the next few years? You know, like let's make it easier now, you know. Um, yeah, so that was. Just I can't not ask this question now. <laughs> I've got my fave question lined up. <laughs> Oh, good. Talking about diversified tactics <laughs> <laughs> and jump, you know, making the jump on um, consent so these things don't happen and improve future. One of the things that came out of the Me Too movement in response to it in the tech world was these innovations around blockchain for consent and using blockchain as a means to create agreements in consent. And I was like, this is so interesting. Is is blockchain ever a viable solution to negotiating consent? Emma, one, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give us that shit. Sorry. In the green room, I was like, I'm probably just going to have one long sustained scream. But then Cindy's scream I said, was I'll so much you. better I'll than mine. You. I was like, <laughs> um, yeah. Do uh, it, do it. Oh, I mean, honestly, in the green room, I <laughs> said, do we even have to waste time talking about this? I mean, that is a classic goddamn white male developer lens on this whole scenario. Honestly, I, I don't even want to waste time talking about it other than to say that, you know, the blockchain provides all sorts of really, really interesting uses for all sorts of things. Consent is not one of them. You know, consent is not about, you know, in the heat of the moment, bringing out a contract and making somebody click on it so that when they change their mind about what you're doing, you can then say, oh, no, 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 you agreed, and now I can fucking well rape you. 
No, I mean, that's out bloody rageous. So, mm. uh, and honestly, you know, let's not waste our time even discussing that. <laughs> Just let's go back to these fabulous scream. audience's questions instead, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can I just add, I just wanted to add one thing. Yes. I'm I'm sorry. I'm, I know it's like super <laughs> okay, stupid. I'll allow but, you. <laughs> um, I mean, like, just to like bring it to a personal level. Um, I mean, like when my Facebook messages were picked through, one that was like hotly debated was this one where I said like "fuck me in the butt" or something like that, and the full sentence was something like "ugh, I have to wake up at six a.m. tomorrow. Fuck me in the butt," and like. <sighs> You know when people say something like, oh my god, the F train is down, shoot me in the head. They're not actually asking to be <laughs> shot in the head because that would be terrible. Um, it's just kind of like a turn of phrase. Back then, um, my group of friends used to say fuck me in the butt as like the turn of phrase for shoot me in the head. Which I guess I don't re recommend for anyone because then if you <laughs> then get anally raped, they will go back through your Facebook message and be like, but you wanted it. Um, <laughs> so, so don't say shoot me in the head. Don't say fuck me in the butt. Any, or you can. Maybe we should just change consent culture. But um, uh, yeah, it, I mean, like, just imagine that on even a larger scale, mm. right? Like with this kind of blockchain app, like you know, you would then be held accountable for like. You know, let's say you said you were into anal sex and then like the way this guy did it sucked and you weren't into it anymore. You would be like held to that first initial thing you put on your app. So anyway, just wanted to bring it to the personal level of like, no, bad idea. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I think it does point to there is a massive gap in even even people being able to have those conversations, right? If we're going, oh, well, we can do this thing, like... Which is exactly why Make Love Not Porn is making it easier for everyone in the world to talk openly and honestly about sex. That Perfect. is exactly why social sex. There you go. Do, there, there, there are a ton of hands, by the way. Um, there's some over there. Hello. Um, so my question is to everyone, but uh, Cindy, this is based on some of the things that you've been discussing. Um, I currently work at a dating app, and before that I was working in the sex toy industry, and I'm actually quite surprised at just how many questions we get as a dating app around consent, um, even before taking your clothes off, right? So I constantly am getting questions like, uh, when do you have sex? Is it on the first date, the second date, the third oh, date? Oh. And it's just, you know, talking about terms that we're creating, you know, I get asked by press all the time about ghosting and stashing and zombieing, all these terms to describe because people don't know what it, you know, how to describe what it means when someone just doesn't text you back. And so I think that, you know, while there is so much that needs to be done in the sex tech world, there is this bridge that needs to be, you know, combined between the sex tech and dating world because there's just so many questions from the initial sit down first date. So I guess my question is, what can we do as dating apps? We have the technology, we have the users, and we have the voice to make a big impact. And how do we bridge that gap? Do you know, um, sorry, I'll, I'll just, because, the, and that speaks to, I got an email a few months ago from a man who was a new Make Love Not Porn member. And he, he wrote a fan email. He said, oh my God, I love your platform, I love your videos. Then he said, Please, 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 will you start a dating website? Because I just know that everybody on your dating website would be a stellar person. Talk about brand endorsement, by the way. <laughs> um, and so I wrote back to him and said, actually, funny enough, we have in the pipeline the Make Love Not Porn dating app. I have, haven't had the funding to build it. But the Make Love Not Porn dating app matches people based on social and sexual values. And when I say that, I don't mean sexual tastes. I mean sexual values like the ones I cited earlier of generosity and kindness. And, you know, um, and it goes back to my point about when you openly acknowledge that, hey, guess what? When you're dating somebody, you tend to have sex with them. Let's all be open about this, socialize it, normalize it. That then enables you to actually build into your app good sexual values, good sexual behavior, to talk about what that constitutes, and by the way, to help your users who are desperately fumbling their way in the dark when we don't talk about any of this. You know, again, it goes back to don't shut down, open up. Normalize it, socialize it. You know, just, you know, make it part of, you know, um, to, I mean, as a dating app, make it part of the way you talk about yourself. Build it into the how this works. You know, just talk about it. Um, I, um, uh, people regularly say to me, Cindy, you know, how can we help 
make love, not porn. You know, to, um, you know, if I had if I had loads of money, I'd fund you, but I don't. So what can I do? You know, I've, I've joined the platform, I've rented a video, and I go. There's one thing you can do to help us. There's one micro action you can take every day. Just talk about sex. And I don't mean, hmm, now I have to talk about se- I mean, when you're having a conversation every day, as you do, uh, where, if we were not so fucked up about it, you would naturally talk about sex, do that. So my version of this is, on Facebook, you know, when, when friends have fabulous birthday celebrations or they're on some nauseatingly jealousy-inducing vacation and everyone's leaving comments going, happy birthday, or, oh, my God, you know, that beach looks amazing. You know, I leave comments and I will say... <laughs> Uh, you know, no, no, I'll say, happy birthday, hope you had great birthday sex. <laughs> or I will say, gorgeous speech, hope you had great sex on it. Because you know they are. You know, um, just normalise it. You know, and, and so, that, I mean, that would be my response. Just normalise the fact that this is what people are using your app ultimately to do and help them do it. Yeah, it is surprising that, like, the dating apps don't have, at least when I was using them, like, a field for, like, sexual tastes values, whatever, or just like explanation of something sexual, <laughs> you know, like, cause it is dating and like you're matching based on your interests. Um, and so that is like, yeah, the point that you brought up about just um, kind of like building it into the feature as like a normal thing. Do you think that like at this point it would, like if they did that, it would be like, it would, I don't know, like it wouldn't go over well or, you know, like if they kind of were like, like, what's the reason <laughs> that it's not, you know, kind of... Well, well it, it, it goes back to my point about um, um, it has come from a place of authenticity, and it does that when the female lens, the diverse lens, you know, the disabled lens, the LGBTQ lens, you know, whatever it is, is brought to bear. Because um, when you have, I mean, I mean, Tinder, you know, all-male founding team, all-male dev team, all male funding, therefore all male advisory board, um, what you get is an enormously influential app that, that grew out of an entirely male-centric worldview, which is that the only criteria of dateability is an utterly superficial one looks swipe right, swipe left. And when you operate that at scale, I mean, swipe, the idea of swiping has now embedded itself in our public consciousness, the idea of instant dismissibility. Now, by the way, there's nothing wrong with that as long as it is counterbalanced and counterpointed by an equally influential female-centric worldview, and it's not. You know, I wish society understood the opposite of what it thinks is true. Women enjoy sex just as much as men, and men are just as romantic as women. And neither gender is allowed to openly celebrate that fact. And there are men who are using Tinder who want to be in love. And it's not helping them do that necessarily, um, you know, as much as, as much as anybody else. And, and so, you know, it has to come from a place where many different, I mean, diversity of tactics, actually, to diversity of approaches um, that actually reflects the world of that, that ridiculous, messy world of relationships and sex and dating the way it really is, with all of our viewpoints taken account of to design an experience that works for all of us. And also just to follow up on that really quick, uh, um, it's really hard for women in the dating space to be funded. You know, it's not just sex oh, tech. Oh, I know. And I know. if you want to be a female founder in the dating space, you can't, you know, make preferences about sex because our investors will frown mm-hmm. upon that. So it's right. just, it's dating and sex and relationships and, and all of it. No, it's infuriating. I have many um, female founder friends who tried to start dating apps, couldn't get funded and shut them down. Um, th- you know, that, that, that female counterpoint is not there because of that. You're absolutely right. I'm really sad that we have to wrap it up. Um, I just want one really good question to end it on. <laughs> I, I have ooh, questions, ooh, but someone's got a really good question right there. <laughs> no <Thanks>. pressure. Um, <laughs> she's your funder, so. <laughs> um, um, so thank you for being here. But um, what I wanted to ask was really, it goes back to some of your stories and even the Harvey Weinstein thing, where it seems as though the singular female voice is one of distrust is one of like skepticism and so it's something where we have to have that this like whisper network we have to have this community constantly it has to be numbers in order for us to have a voice that is believable and so i wanted to ask and we talked a lot about language and stuff i really wanted to ask like what is the bridge that we can connect now back to and this is an issue in globalization too where you have these incidents and for me 
as a woman of color who comes from South Asia, who comes from a country that um, unfortunately rape is such a tool and it's done on that singular individual basis where the woman in her singular voice is not believed and it takes you know going public and going into a bigger lens which is you know obviously for anyone who goes through that very uncomfortable so how do we use like like we're opening up lanes of language now how do we bring that back to where the singular female voice can be one of tr a source of trust and a source of honesty and a source of like information to help you know cure some of these things or you know address some of these things more people like you asking questions like that. <laughs> <laughs> you can go first. I have a longer answer. <laughs> um, 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 no, um, 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 what I would say is, um, uh, I mean, the answer to that, by the way, is um, not easy, but but it's something that we can all play our, our small part in every day. Um, and by the way, I've been trying to find investors to make love, not porn, India for several years. I'm 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 very determined to do that. Um, it, um, the, um, the way the way you enable what you've just asked is to actively create a culture that respects women more. You have to elevate the status of women, unfortunately. Um, and unfortunately, absolutely fortunately. Um, but, um, but but I say I say unfortunately because that is the only answer to, um, to the question you've asked. Um, you know, singular female voices will be believed when everybody believes women. You know, I mean, I mean, you have to make the general happen in order to, and so that that requires every one of us every day using diversity of tactics, micro actions to make that happen. You know, whether you are a male ally who ensures that you know your female colleague is not talked over in the meeting, that some man doesn't claim credit for her ideas. You know, every one of us every day can do something that, that elevates the status of women. And there are many people. I assume you're from India, by the way. Um, are you from India? Or? Right. Yeah. Uh, um, um, only because um, to, uh, I've been there several times in the past few years, and I know there are many people there working, as there are in other Asian countries, to actually try and make that happen. But but that is what has to happen. Does that make sense? No. Um, I I think that like you know one term that I really want to abolish <laughs> is attention whore. Um, I think mm. that oh my god yeah. when as soon as a femme like even more than women, a femme person does anything, says anything, like walks out of their apartment, right? They're suddenly an attention whore. And um, I think that, you know, again, on a personal level, like when I spoke out about being assaulted, it was because I was trying to save people, not because I wanted attention for it. In fact, like I never even wanted it in the first place. And that's the whole point of what rape is. Um, but I think that, you know, when a man gets attention, it's not because he's an attention whore, it's because he's an important person who deserved it and is doing a great job at whatever he's doing, right? Um, I, I hear attention whore leveled at, you know, creatives so often, which is ridiculous because it's like, you know, I made mattress performance because it's, you know, art is supposed to be this thing where you express your emotions. <laughs> it's a thing you make and you show to people. Um, and people are like, oh, well, you must have wanted attention for mattress performance. And it's like, well, I mean, like, I didn't realize it was going to get so much attention, but it's not like, you know, all artists are making paintings that they shove under their bed, right? Like, you, you make an artwork and put it out there in the same way that, like, you don't sing, like, a songwriter doesn't sing their song into their pillow. They're, like, singing it into a microphone, right? Like, people do things because... We're trying to like communicate with others, and if we keep this word attention whore around, like we're gonna continue believing that like it's for the wrong reasons. Um, so, so yeah, I think I mean I guess that's my answer. Like, women are only going to be believed when they're seen as like speaking for valid reasons rather than like you know attention, but like also understanding that attention is a good thing for women because their stories really do need to be heard. Like we need to start understanding that um, it's, yeah, maybe we need to create, you know what, like maybe we, we can do this. Like we can all like come, we can all come back together and be like, what's what would be the antidote term to attention whore? Maybe like great attention receiver? Like, I don't know, <laughs> something catchier than that? <laughs> We'll think on that. Empowered attention. I don't know. I'm going to work on this now. <laughs> yeah.
I would love, yeah, something grabby. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not in a bad way. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I think what's happening right now is a lot of course correction. And so in addition to like, um, you know, like the general um, atmosphere helping the individual, which um, is, you know, like usually the case, um, I feel like correcting people is a course of action, correcting men. <laughs> um, and maybe, you know, there was this idea of not wanting to um, hurt their ego or like not wanting to like feel like you're being sensitive for saying, um, for saying in an interaction that you feel uncomfortable or whatever. Um, and so I think um, just correcting um, the idea of like, uh, the, this, the volume of um, conversation that's happening right now being kind of like um, a result of there not having been any is um, like that is very true. And the fact that it's kind of, um, you know, these are these are things that are happening. It's not, <laughs> you know, these are things that are happening and we should, it should be a course correction and we should be correcting people about behavior or language or um, just, actions that are wrong, illegal, um, uncomfortable, whatever. Um, so I think, um, I mean, that's kind of like a small thing maybe, but um, you know, uh, not being afraid like in your personal life to like correct somebody who's like offending you in um, like your private space or whatever um, is important. And it's something that I've been kind of like trying to do <laughs> actively. Wow. Thank you, everyone, so much for coming. But thank you, Cindy, Emma and Clover, for being so generous with your words and your time here tonight. It's been an, such an honour to have you. And I'm sad that we have to finish. I know there are a lot more questions, but thanks so much for coming. You'll find the podcast at futureofsex.org. There'll be more events over the summer as well. The next one's June 25th. Go listen to the podcast. More importantly, go and find these women at their websites. Clover, yours is? Um, I'm at Clovito under Twitter. And, yeah. Under, uh, yeah, my website is just my name dot com. But I, I, I'll, I tend I'll to, include all these I'm things. trying to start getting into Twitter. This is my new project. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And please, everybody, go to makelovenotporn.tv. Please join, rent one video, because that'll give us a nice little jolt of income, and consider becoming a Make Love Not Porn star and sharing your real-world sex on our platform. There you go. Thank you so much. See you guys. Thank you. Thank you.